open up to Ephesians chapter 6 again, put a marker in Joshua. I'm not going to redo that same lesson, but we're going to kind of quickly review and then do a springboard from there. And uh, I remember uh, when Dave taught on uh, all of the strategies of the devil. Do y'all remember that series? I can't remember the name of it, the name of it right now, but... Uh, Boy, I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot from that. But here in Ephesians 6, where it talks about the strategies and wiles of the devil, uh, boy, it is so important to us right now. If we're going to go on the offensive. See, I, th- I think you are amazing to the devil that you are still here. I mean, there's so many that, have, that are gone, you know, and we've God love them. We bless them in, in the name of Jesus, you know. But, I mean, if you've been around here very long, you know that if you're going to really do this message, you're going to get everything thrown at you, including the kitchen sink. And especially if you're on the, if you're on the aggressive warfare path, see. And the fact that you're still here, some of you have gone and come back. <laughs> For other reasons. <laughs> but uh, I, I think he's amazed, you know. And I look around the room, you know, and and I'm always reminded of what it says in Corinthians, not many mighty, not many noble. You know, I'm like, I don't see the governor. I don't see the mayor, you know, you know, God chose, God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. How many are candidates? Me too. And just raise our hand here. Hallelujah. You know, you know, (laughs) we're just plain enough to believe him and believe that what he said is true. And if we do what he said. We'll have what he said. Amen? So let's look at this again now in Ephesians uh, chapter 6. For years, this has been one of my favorite passages, but how to really do it and how to live it is, is, is a different thing. And we're, I'm loving how he put this together for me. I had never really seen this until just recently. As This is one... Yes, sir. My understanding of the wiles of the devil. In fact, hold your. We will get to Ephesians six, but I, I've got to follow him through the service. Go to Mark four. See, this is normally what you think of when it comes to the strategies of the devil. Excuse me. Mark four, the parable of the sower. Now he he tells you plainly that the sower sows the word here. Well, that can be the word to get you saved. It could be the word to get you healed. It could be the word to get you baptized in the Holy Ghost. But in tonight's context, let's talk about the words that you receive from God, a rhema word, an instruction word. This is your assignment. You are a good liver in the body of Christ. And this is what I've called you to do, liver. Now this is what you're supposed to do or spleen or lung or whatever part you are. You get an assignment. You get a word from him on the... Mark Jenkins' parable, it would be one of the red flags on the rope, okay? You got your word. Well, uh, pick it up in verse 14. The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, in other words, you heard your word, you got it. Either you heard it directly from him, maybe Dave gave you a prophecy. Uh, You know, if it's like Balaam, a donkey came up and spoke to you. (laughs) But somehow or another, you receive the word. You've got it. There's your red flag. You've got it. Okay. Well, what's the strategy of the devil? When they have heard, Satan waits about three weeks and then he comes. No. When is it? Satan cometh when? Immediately. And if he can, he takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. He'll just take it away. Like (laughs) I remember a minister years ago that I really admire and God had given him two assignments, and he was like a, a teacher and a prophet. And so he went around, you know, God told him, I'm going to use you in both of these offices, teacher and prophet. So, you know, years go by, I think 10 years or something go by, a long time, and all he does is teach. And one day the Lord says, now, what were you going to do about that prophet anointing I gave you? And he says, Lord, I wasn't planning on doing anything about that thing. Well, he took it away, see? You know, you just, you, the word still exists because once God speaks something, it never goes away. But you can just forget all about it. It's like it's gone. 
Tim, I was re-listening, but I highly recommend this, re-listening to the messages Tim has done this year. They are so rich, you can't get all of that in one setting. But he was talking about all the people that's been hearing these and that he's been talking to. He says, you know, so many of them had their words in a drawer somewhere. They had just put them away. They'd forgotten about it, like, okay, this is not it. They weren't worrying over it anymore. They just got beat out. And it's easy over time. Just get beat out, like, you know, so the Lord might talk to you five years down the road. Whatever that word was, he said, what were you planning on doing about that word? Lord, I wasn't planning on doing anything about that word, you know. Well, he hadn't forgot about it. He intends for us to do warfare. For every word that he's spoken for us to come to pass. Well, so anyway, Satan comes immediately and he, he'll, he'll do his best to just take it away. Like, it, like you never got it. Like you never heard it. Now verse 16, these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground. Who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness. Yeah. This reminds me of people that first time they hear about the message, they hear Dave preach about tongues and you mean, I know how I was. You mean that there is a way that I don't have to go about wondering and guessing what God's plan is for my, you mean there is a way on purpose where I can fellowship with the Holy ghost and I can know for sure what he's called me to do. And if I've got flaws, he'll fix them. There is, a, there is a way to do that. On, that's about the way I was. A lot of people are that way. They get all excited. We've got, I'm so sorry, your name? Joseph. Joseph. Good name. Hallelujah. Just moved here from San Diego. San Diego. Welcome to the bullseye, Joseph. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph, he's excited. A young man, giving his life to God, moves all the way from San Diego. Glory to God. Come to the bullseye. Hallelujah. Welcome to kitchen sink area. <laughs> kitchen sinks flying by your ears, you know. And, but a lot of people, they get excited and they come. Not, not Joseph. He's going to endure. He read the prophecy already out there. He's going to endure with us. But I know. Let's go back to Gary. Oh, yeah, this is great. I'm going to start doing this. Yeah, I'm going to pray. What's the, what's the next verse say? You receive it with gladness, but has no root in himself. And so endures. What was the key in the prophecy out there? Endurance is the key. So he endures, but for a time. Afterward, <laughs> when kitchen sinks are flying by your ears, <laughs> when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And that we've, how many have we seen over the years? I mean, you old timers, you're youngsters, but you old timers that's been here a while. We've seen them come by the hundreds, excited. You don't, you don't pull up and move halfway across the country if you're not excited and serious. Now, they're, they were excited. They were serious. They heard the word with gladness. You don't, especially if you're married and got kids, you don't uproot your family and move here unless you're serious about it. But see, the enemy is pretty good at what he does. You got to give him his due. He is a persistent rascal and eventually beat you out. Okay. Well, these, okay, let's go ahead and get the rest of these. Uh, then there's verse 18. These are they which are sown among thorns. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. Boy, and the cares of this world. Let's just stop right there. Let's don't, let's don't lump it all together. Just the cares of this world. I think about my son-in-law right now, married to our uh, eldest daughter, Erin. They got two little kids that you guys know, Cole and Lily, just the light of my life. Right, right next to Jesus, there's Cole and Lily, you know, right now. I love all my grandkids, but they're just that age right now, you know. And, uh, but I'm telling you, it's expensive to raise two kids. And Kyle, thank God, he's a good, hard-working man. Uh, works uh, for Pepsi, honest employment. But, boy, it's a lot of hours. I mean, a lot of hours. That guy works so much and, and comes in. And if you're not careful, see... I mean, do y'all know it takes kids a while to grow up? <laughs> do you know after they leave the house when they're 18, a lot of times the responsibility for money does not leave with them? You know? I mean, if you're not careful, it's so easy, especially in those years when you've got young kids and so much expenses and so much to do. I've got football practice and Lily's in dance class now and I don't know what all's going on, you know? 
It's so easy to let that word be choked out of you. You just get so busy. And that's what it says, the cares of this world. Just the daily living, every day is so daily. That's why I come up with that name of that particular devil that beat so many people out of prayer. I found out his name, you know. His name is Samo. Yep. Samo, Samo. Every day, every day, every day. Worked another 12 hours, got home, had to do this, had to do that, take out the trash, take out the mow the lawn, do what, change the oil, do whatever. And I fell into bed. No, I, I'll pray tomorrow. And then tomorrow it's Samo and Samo. Then a decade goes by and you wonder, what happened to the word? <laughs> what happened to the. I was so excited. Well, the, then the deceitfulness of riches. He goes right after that cares of the world. The devil says, if you only had more money. Mm -hmm. I mean, anyone ever hear that, that devil? If you only had more money, then you wouldn't have to work so hard. Yeah, but what usually comes with the money? Like Dave says, if you're the one that gets the money, then normally the money gets you. The better thing to do is allow God to purge you of the love of money. Then he can bring you money. And when he brings you money, then the money doesn't have you. You have the money. And you can use it for the kingdom. But you've seen it so often. I mean, with anybody, it doesn't have to be a preacher, just anybody, you know. You start, especially if you've worked hard and been in lack for a long time and just barely. I mean, for Sue and I, it seemed like we just had one nostril above financial oblivion. <laughs> you know, that's where this mantra came from. Okay, we did not die today. Based on everything I see, surely we will die tomorrow. I mean, <laughs> that went on for years, you know. Then when some abundance starts coming, uh, yes, sir, I'll tell that on myself. See, those of you looking forward to a pulpit ministry, it's always, he's not always so nice to you. You get to tell on yourself a lot. <laughs> he told me one time, this is after, oh, you know, it wasn't during that early days. We'd, let's say this might have been 10 years in, into ministry. He told me one day, I'm just praying in the Holy Ghost, minding my own business. He said, you've already, he said, how do you say it exactly? Yes, you've, you've already failed the pros prosperity test three times. And I had a real intelligent response like, what? <laughs> what? What are you talking about? Yeah, you've already failed the prosperity test three times, you know. And I'm going, God, I didn't buy any new boat. I didn't buy an airplane. I didn't buy, you know, we're driving a 15-year-old car. <laughs> you know, what, what are you talking about? And he started reminding me, you know, oh, in the days when we didn't know where our next biscuit was coming from, my prayer life was sterling. Man, was I in prayer. I was at that ugly building. I was praying. Then when things got a little more comfortable, now not abundance, but just comfortable, just the, the bills were paid and no, nobody was calling asking for money. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? Then just a he said, just a little abundance. He asked me, he said, what happened to your prayer life? All of a sudden, there's a little, oh, we've worked hard, haven't we? We, you know, we, we, deserve, a, we deserve a reward, you know? I, what's on that other channel, honey? Let's see what's over there. And see, television itself is not a sin. But if it takes you out of your prayer life, if it takes you out of your calling, if it takes you out of what he's, what he's I, I was looking for a, a poster that somebody gave me. I thought I had left it over there, but the cleanup crew must have got it. This is a poster that Sue and I made over 20 years ago. I had it on the bathroom mirror of my house for a good year so that every time you come in there, every time I'd see it, then I'd say it and think about it. And it's really a quote that I got from Tim Stemple in the early days. And he says, <clears throat> whatever took you out of prayer last week, that's what the devil looks like in your life. Even if it was good things like your job, your grandkids, vacation, whatever. Now, don't read into that more than what it says. It doesn't say those things are bad. Don't tell me my grandkids are bad. You know? <laughs> what it's saying is, though, if, I, if, I let my, if God has given me an assignment of prayer, or if there's a regimen of prayer that I'm supposed to be doing, and I know it. See, to me, prayer is not works at all. Prayer is just like going to college. Exactly. 
It's exactly like going to college. That's why emotions don't matter. You know, they don't care in, in engineering school, pick differential equations. They don't care if you're excited about it or not. Your emotions about that class make no difference whatsoever. Oh, I'm excited to go to difference. They could care less. What's important is the knowledge that is imparted. Did you receive it or did you not? That's what praying in tongues is. That's why Dave says it doesn't matter if you shout it from the rooftops or if you whisper. It's not the volume that makes any difference. It is the syllables. It is the information that is being transmitted. That's what matters, see. Well, when God was wanting to train us for ministry, he had me in a job where I could pray 40, 50, 60 hours a week. Well, it didn't take very long at that rate, 17 months from the time I made that decision till the time he called me full time, 17 months. That's, that's way less than a college education. It usually takes four years, you know. But I remember well, I mean, when, trust me, when I started at OSU, you did not want to be an engineer. When I started, you did not want me to design a bridge for you. You wouldn't want to drive over it. I did not know anything. I did not know how. Four years later, I can design a bridge and it'll work. Why? Well, I'm the same person. It's the knowledge that I receive. That's what praying in tongues is, first and foremost. You don't know what your calling is. You don't know what's wrong with you. You don't know how to get from where you are to where you need to be. God says, well, I know all that. How about you let me pray that through you? That's what, that's what praying in other tongues is. You find out what your calling is. You find out what his assignment is for you. Item by item by item. Okay, I'm not going to go back and reteach all that. Well, getting back to these, the first level of understanding of the wiles of the devil. First, if, if he can't beat you out of it with these other things and the cares of this world, then the deceitfulness of riches. And he'll start getting you thinking, well, if I only had more money. Well, now, so the logical thing there is, like in Kyle's case, you know, just a normal a fellow with a job, raising a family. Well, I need to get more overtime. That's what it is. I need to get more overtime or I need to get a second job. Well, now you've taken even more prayer, more of your life out of the equation when it comes to prayer. See, strategies of the devil, whatever took you out of prayer, whatever's successfully taking you. And let's do more than prayer now. That was what I wrote in the early days. Today, it would be whatever took you out of the seven pillars. All seven things, see. There's got to be some of that going on, some of it. Well, deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things. Well, that's, you get tired of prayer. Get tired of living on, and it's not really God's best, but I'm going to quote another of my favorite preachers. He gets tired living on Grumble Alley right next to, what is that? I forgot the rest of it. Right next to Barely Enough Street or something like that. Barely get along street. That's it. There you go. We got some people in here. Yeah, you get tired of that after a while. Say, I want a new motorcycle. Now, God, I'm going to get me a motorcycle. He says, what about your prayer life? I don't care about my prayer life. And I want it. And I want it today. I'm going to go charge it. I'm going to go buy it on my credit card. Well, now you've entered into the, the borrower is servant. You've bowed your knee to another master now. Now, just if you have debt, don't throw rocks at me and don't go away condemned. I'm talking about frivolous borrowing. I'm not talking about other kinds. There's all kinds of reasons, okay? But I've seen that at this very church. I've had enough of this. I want prosperity and I want it now. I'm tired of this. I've been praying 10 years or well, five years or six months. <laughs> I want a motorcycle. I want it today, God. I'm going to go buy it. And put, now you're in, you know, my motorcycles are not cheap, you know. Depends on what you get. But you can go up about $12,000 pretty easy on a motorcycle. Now, all of a sudden now you've made a mistake. And now you put yourself as, if you're going to be a, you put yourself as a servant to another master. Now you've got to pay that thing off. You see, deceitfulness of rich. And Dave goes beyond there when he says the lusts of other things. That's where the God complex comes in. Do you still have that picture? Dave, one time teaching on his, look at all these places I got marked. Okay, can't use all those. Dave, one time, uh, passed out this picture, and I'll walk up close to the camera. This is a picture from uh, God's Generals by Robert Salaridan. And this is Alexander Dowie near the end of his life in ministry. The, uh, 
this lusts of other things, it gets to be kind of a God complex. He firmly believed that he was Elijah to come. And so he, was, uh, he and Jesus were going to rule. And notice he went out and got him a nice funny hat. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what all this is. Je he called himself the general overseer of Zion in his high priest robe. Lots of other things, I'm special. William Branham, uh, actually, they actually got him to believing. Those, when I say they, I don't mean people, I mean demonic spirits. I'll just tell you what it is. They got him believing that he was born. He was the only person born with a special palate. His mouth was shaped in such a way that only he, out of all the billions of people that's ever lived, only he could say God's name correctly because of the shape of the bone structure of his mouth. That makes you a little special, doesn't it? Of all the people that ever lived. Those kinds of things, if you do this message, praying in other tongues and fasting. See, you, the devil's going to have a hard time hooking somebody with things like that unless there's you know, if, there's, if the root of pride has been taken down. It's hard. You can't hook somebody with that unless there's pride still in there. Something in you wants to be special. Something in I want to be special, you know. Well, we all want to serve him and please him. But pride comes for, before destruction, you know. So, so the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things, which that's not only material things, it's Bigger ministry. It's, I, I remember in the early days, I, I was wanting to pattern my ministry after a certain, certain kind. And I had visions. I don't, I don't say this very often. I told you all I used to serve money. I used to have visions of having this worldwide fancy ministry. You know, best suits, airplanes, fancy cars. Well, I saw these other ministers had that. Of course, at the time, I don't want to say that. It's too mean. But, it, you know, nothing, it didn't take the Holy Ghost long to where nothing, n there's not anything in me that cares about that at all. I mean, I, there's n I check, no, nope, there's nothing there. <laughs> you know, and it, I get invitations from all over the world. I mean, and some of them are genuine. Some of them are hoping the American comes with money. <laughs> Just to be honest with you, you know. And, but there's some, in the early days, you know, I was subject to that because at pick a country, it doesn't matter, India, Pakistan, Africa, Ghana, it doesn't matter, you pick one, Canada, I you, <laughs> just pick one. Oh, you are the best teacher we've ever heard. You've got to bring this wisdom to our country, we, we, our whole country. And before they're done with you, you think, if I don't go, the country will go under. <laughs> well... The Holy Ghost will eliminate all that kind of thinking on the inside of you, okay? So those are, we've taught about those levels and those kinds of strategies for years. But now we are finally getting to Ephesians 6, all right? Go to Ephesians 6. That was, that was nice. That was a good refresher. Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Boy, I, I never really connected this up, this verse, to, first, to Joshua chapter 9 until Wednesday night. So I don't think you need to, I just want you to see that wiles of the devil. You see that? And notice, remember again, he's drawn an analogy we're, he says, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. That's a direct analogy to the book of Joshua. Well, the book of Joshua is not about the people of God holed up in some castle trying to defend off enemy invaders. Actually, they were the enemy invaders. <laughs> they had come to possess the land. So in, in the, when it talks about the wiles of the devil, it's talking about strategies that the devil has to divert you from your mission while you're possessing the land. And I, I knew the story was in there, the, the story about the Gibe, Gibeon, the story about the Gibeonites has been one of my favorites for years. But when, when Mark, go back to Joshua 9 now for a minute. 
when uh, Mark read this verse, I don't know how I hadn't seen it before. Look at Joshua 9 verse 4. And they did work how? In a King James it says, wildly. <laughs> wildly. That you may be able to stand against the wiles. So Dave has told us for years what that means. The strategies of the devil. His plans to divert you off course. And I'm not going to read that whole story again today. But in this particular strategy, the type and... Okay, in this particular... They fought against flesh and blood. They were not supposed to make agreements or covenants of any kind with the people of the land. The people of the land are types and shadows of strongholds. God wants us completely free. He does not want you making agreements with your strongholds. He wants the strongholds to be cast down and anything in you that loves that damnable thing to be put to death. That's, that's the type and shadow. Well, here, where they were fighting against flesh and blood, the Gibeonites saw the massacres that were happening against Jericho and Ai, and they're going, we better do something. We're next. And I couldn't help it. I looked it up while Mark was preaching in my maps part of the Bible. Gibeon is only 17 miles from Jericho. I mean, they, they are not from a long ways off. They are close by. These are people that no doubt God intended to be uh, exterminated from that land. What's the type and shadow? This is a stronghold in you that is supposed to be put to death. But this thing begins negotiating. <laughs> and lies. Did you know your flesh will lie to you? Did you know the devil will lie to you? And so they're suspicious. They're suspicious and they're going, where are you guys from? I'm not going to read the whole story. What they did, even though they're 17 miles away, they packed moldy food with them. They put on old dusty clothes that looked like they'd been on the road long. They, they, they got their old wore out shoes or sandals, whatever they wore. The, per, the point was to make them think, oh, we, we don't live in this land at all. We're from a long ways off. No, no, we're not one of your enemies. Actually, we're here to help you. We've come to be your servants. And I told you this morning, that's what nicotine used to lie to me like that all the time. I'm here to help you. You have such a violent temper, you'd probably be a murderer in jail if you didn't have me. I, I, used, to, I used to believe those lies. I used to believe it. Y'all don't know the guy I used to be. I had a temper, boy. And, uh, oh, that cigarettes would tell me that all the time. Yeah, if you quit smoking, you probably kill somebody. <laughs> Lying devil. Lion devil, and I listened to those Gibeonites. <laughs> I listened to the Nicotinites for a long time. <laughs> but see, finally, they had to be put to death because I couldn't go to the. Yes, sir. I came. Oh, that's good. That's good. Mark, you're going to like this. Mm. I came to the last red flag. Do y'all remember the rope? Remember the red flags? I came to the last red flag. I knew what my next flag was. The next flag on my rope, he'd already told me going overseas, ministry overseas. We went to Poland, Africa, South Korea. That's the next red flag. But I had come to the last, you know, remember there's a whole bunch of black flags and that represents strongholds. If y'all haven't seen that, you've got to see that visual demonstration. Well, some of these red flags I could accomplish without dealing with that particular black flag. It's like I kept sliding it down the rope. <laughs> Slide that them down the rope. Yeah, I'm still serving you, God. Here I am. See my black? Yeah, I'm sliding that black flag. I'm sliding it down the rope. And finally, though, I come to the last one. Because to go overseas, where he, where he was going to send me, I didn't know it till I got there. He knew it. He says, they won't believe a word you say. If you don't deal with this in the flesh, they will not believe it. I found that to be true. Now, it's not that way in Poland. Trust me. Everybody smokes in Poland. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> We had to change planes in the Charles de Gaulle airport in France. And I was a lifetime smoker. And the, sm the nicotine smell was so strong, I nearly went out under the power. I'm just, <laughs> God. <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered there. But when, we, when I got to South Africa, when I got over to South Africa, there, now they, what's amazing, you know, it's different cultures have different things. They have wine. These Pentecostal tongue-talking Christians over there, they have wine with every meal. They don't get drunk, but, you know, you can't get away with that here. But over there, if you smoke, you cannot possibly be saved in smoke. I mean, that's just, they, they won't listen to anything you have to say. Well, the Lord knew that. I didn't know that. I'm, that's the next red flag. I'm, I'm going overseas. And this time I'm trying to slide my black rope down the, my black flag down the rope. 
I'm trying to get by with it. <laughs> and he, he visited me. He, vi- he said, no. He says, I'm not going to send you. There's no point in sending you. He says, no, you can do other things for me. And you are doing work for me. And you're going to have a reward when you come to heaven. This is not a heaven or hell issue. Like Dave says, a three-inch cigarette won't send you to hell. It'll just make you smell like you've already been there. Not a heaven or hell issue, but he just plain, plainly told me, he says, I can't send you. I knew what the, I, in that case, I knew what the next red flag was. I can't send you unless you deal with this stronghold because they, won't, they just won't believe me. He says, and, and you don't have to. It's still my choice. God never makes you do nothing, never makes you do anything. But he just, he just told me, he says, now, you can do other things for me like you're doing now. You've you got a good reward, and when you come to heaven, you're going to get a reward. But he says, before I wipe away every tear. And, and if, even as I'm about to tell it, the emotion rises up in me. I'll never forget it. He says, before I wipe away every tear, he says, I'm going to have to draw back a curtain. I'm going to have to show you all of the things it was my will for you to do. That I never could send you to do. Because you wouldn't deal with this stronghold. God. I never smoked another cigarette again. The withdrawals were terrible. They lasted forever. I think he supernaturally extended them out. <laughs> I don't. I don't really. Don't write me no letters. But it's. Because I'd hear all these other people. Pat Robertson all the time on the 700 Club. All you got to go is 21 days for any addiction. And you'll be free. And I'm going. You were never addicted to anything. Were you? <laughs> don't tell me that. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> I mean I suffered. By, by, I'm telling you I suffered in the flesh now. <laughs> I think part of the reason for that. I paid. It was such a price in the flesh. I don't ever want to pay that price again. I'm not going back to that again, okay? Or anything else, anyway. So, but that's such a perfect analogy. I, in, this, in my case, now you may not know what the next red flag is. See, a lot of times you don't. You may not know what his next step for you, but you, maybe you've slid a stronghold down the rope. This would be a good title, slide the stronghold down the rope, you know. Boy, that's perfect. That's exactly what I did for years. See, you start way down. I love that rope thing. You start way down here, and the black flags are very close. Y'all know about those, you know, the strongholds? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You're in for quite a ride, Joseph. Anyway, (laughs) you know, you start praying, and the Holy Ghost reveals stuff in you, you know. And some of them you deal with, you know, some of them are pretty easy and different things, you know, and you go along. And But, see, I I had that nicotine one the whole time. So what was I doing as I think about it now? <laughs> there was a long time in our ministry where I could slide it down the rope. <laughs> hey, it's still working. Hey, I'm thinking, okay, hey, we're, we're, we're preaching now. Glory to God. You know? But eventually you'll come to a place. And I don't care what it is. It could be, I'm always hard, you know, it makes it hard on me and easy on you. I don't know what your stronghold is. I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> Maybe up until now you could still gossip and be okay with it. Maybe you could be jealous, be okay with it. Maybe, in other words, that he could still use you where you are. Obviously, he is. Uh, maybe love of money to a certain point. Who knows what all you've been sliding down the rope? <laughs> Don't be so mean on me. <laughs> but eventually, you're going to come to a place. See, where we're going with revival, Gibeon has to die. We're not... You can only go so far. You know, you, you, there, I, I did have a series of messages which uh, were a long time ago. I think I did them at Jim Martin's church where it talks about any of these ites that you allow to live in the land, any stronghold, any, anything of the flesh. You, re, you can let it remain, but he says they will be thorns and pricks in your eyes. They're going to torment you. They're going to cause you trouble. Hmm. Now, boy, time. Okay, it's not quite that late. The cure. In okay, I gave you the basic story. Okay, the Gibeonites lied to them, convinced them. No, no, we're we're not even your enemy. We've come to serve you and help you. We're good for you, just like nicotine did with me. Whatever. Whatever that thing's been telling you. 
you know. And so they made an agreement with it. They made an agreement with this lying stronghold. Do <laughs> you know what caused that? And it's verse 14. They judged by their five physical senses. It says, okay, we see that your food is moldy. We see that your clothes are old. We see that your shoes are all worn down. Surely the, the evidence, the five physical senses, the evidence is telling us, surely enough, you must not be an enemy. And they made an agreement, a covenant, a league with them. And the reason they did it was verse 14. They asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. The whole thing could have been avoided. All they had to do was ask God. Now, I'm telling you, it's not good to miss any of the meetings right now. Mark, another message that Mark did. I'm not just pumped, you know. But Mark did a message recently called The Fire Moved from, how's it, what's the exact title? The Fire Moved Inside. The fire moved inside. Y'all remember the column of fire? How did you follow God? You followed that column of fire. That worked fine till you got to the promised land. Then what happened? Column of fire ceased. The method you followed God your whole life, which was by sight and by sound and by the five. See, you got Christians still today trying to do that. You know, I'll put out a fleece. I want a three-legged turtle with a blue shell and the name Wilbur written on him. <laughs> to walk up on my front porch with a message in his beak from God. Then I'll know it's God. Well, you're going to get fleeced big time because that's not how God leads you in our generation. And even in the book of Joshua, the column of fire, the, the fire by day and the uh, fire by night and the smoke by day, it ceased. And the leadership, Joshua had to talk. He, he received f to himself the leadership moved from the outside to the inside. What's that a type of? You get born again. You got God on the inside, especially if you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. You got God, the Holy Ghost, who his whole mission, or one of his, not his whole mission, one of his primary functions is to bring you the very mind of Christ. So you won't be an orphan. You won't, won't be guessing. Yes, sir. And that brings us to this. Now, Tim has been reading a portion at times in his teaching from one of my uh, lessons at the website called Waiting Upon God. This is in that face-to-face -face section. This was August 26, 1998, when I received it from the, from the Lord. And uh, let me back up here. <clears throat> and I'll read that one paragraph again. This is the definition that the Holy Spirit gave me. What it does it mean to wait, in, wait on the Lord? He said, to wait upon the Lord is to sit in my presence and hear the mind of the Lord until you have received his counsel in completeness. We have time for this. You old timers will remember this joke. I don't remember Dave doing it recently. He said the problem is with people, even the people that move here to do the message, it starts working, but they, they don't wait until they get the counsel of the Lord in completeness. So this guy came and he prayed and sure enough, he heard the Lord say China. He heard it. He heard it. And it was really the Lord. Man, he sold everything he had. He, he moved his family to China. They're going to have a worldwide ministry and evangelism. They got over there and about starved half to death. The whole family got sick, didn't even win one person to the Lord, come back broken and sick and wounded and tail between the legs. And he starts praying again, Lord, why did you say China? Why did you say China? And the Lord says, your anniversary was coming up. I wanted you to buy your wife some China. <laughs> Now, you've got to wait till you hear the Lord in completeness. I know that's kind of exaggerating, but it's true. <laughs> hear what he says. What general? Now, he may not give you every little detail. I, uh, I really like uh, my favorite verse. If I can only have one verse out of the Bible, it might be John 3.16. But real close to it is John 5.30 in the Amplified. This is my goal. This is how I want to live. This is, if you get on the full armor of God... You're going to be like Jesus. This is how you will function. Jesus says of, about himself. He says, I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge. I decide 
as I am bidden to decide. We don't use the word bidden today. I decide as I am told to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. My judgment is right, just, and righteous because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, or my own purpose. That's that pride thing. But only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. I was thinking about that after the service again. You know what that's a pretty good picture of? Of all the occupations on planet Earth, that's, that's really the mindset of a good soldier. Especially like a private on the front line. He doesn't know the battle plan. He, he doesn't know the whole strategy. What, my liver does not get, know what's going on in my family. <laughs> it's a good analogy, see? My liver has an assignment. And my liver is supposed to accomplish that assignment. I'm not supposed to be checking on the spleen. Well, how are you doing over there? You know, right? And, but every soldier is like that. You don't have to know why we got to go take the hill. The order is take the hill. Your job is to salute, smart, smartly salute, and charge the hill. That's the way it is in the body of Christ. You decide as you're bidden to decide. If your life belongs to him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He wants me to read this next paragraph. He told me earlier, and I got, he loves me. To wait upon the Lord is to sit in my presence, the Holy Spirit saying, and hear the mind of the Lord until you have received his counsel in completeness. At that point, once you know what it is, you yield your will unto his mind. Yes, I'll do that, Lord. I'll do that. You go where I say go. You say what I tell you to say. You do what I say do. You act as I say act. And as you conform to the mind of him who called you, then I perform all the Father's good pleasure as you walk in the steps of the mind of Christ. Now this next verse is verse. This next paragraph to me is so important. Think you it is the Father's will for his children to be guessing, wondering, or assuming what is the mind of Christ for them each day? God, I remember that life. That was my life for virtually 12 years. I loved the Lord. Sue and I both loved. We got, it's all his fault, Michael, back there. We got radically saved, came out of the bars, man, came out of that, you know, serving money lifestyle. Glad we did. Loved Jesus. Man, we'd, I'd witness to a fence post. I'm telling you, you know, we'd do Bible studies in people's homes. We'd do anything. After Michael moved, we did the prison ministry for quite a few years, you know, at our own expense. We were glad to do it. But it was always that feeling. I never, I wasn't hearing him. You know, the Bible, I would read that and Jesus would say, you know, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. But to be honest with you, I felt that way most of the time. When it comes to leadership, I, I didn't feel like an orphan from his love. I, I could feel his love for me. I could feel that forgiveness. I could feel his presence at times. But when it comes to leadership, I, it was just it was always this big silence. And I felt like an orphan. Well, the Holy Spirit, you, he's asking here, do you think it's, that's the Father's will? That the Father has left them as orphans to find their own way through a world of darkness? Do you think that's the Father's will? And part of me goes, felt that way? No, he has not left you orphans. For this purpose, I have been sent to bring you the light of the counsel of the mind of Christ. There is no room for guessing. There is no room, reason for wondering. There is no justification for assuming his will and his mind. I am the helper whom the Father has sent to relieve you from all those things. Take a deep breath and go, thank God, finally. I don't have to guess. I don't have to wonder. This is where that phrase of mine comes from. Quit trying to figure it out and just go pray it out. He is better at what he does than you are bad at what you do. <laughs> he is smarter than you are dumb. If you will give him the time, the prayer life, the just you know, doing the message and give it in a reasonable measure, trust me, he is a better leader than you are a follower. He will get it across, even to you 
I don't care if you think you're the dumbest slug to ever crawl out from under the rock. <laughs> he will get it across to you. He is better than that. He is, he is, he, even to you, he will, if he has to speak to a donkey, we have scripture for that. He can get it across to you. <laughs> I am the helper who has been sent to relieve you from all those things, says the spirit of truth. I bring the mind of Christ in great detail for those who are willing to sit and wait upon their God until they receive the counsel the specific will of the mind of Christ in every situation. Isn't that something? Oh, pardon, it's hard for me to stop reading right there. There's uh, five pages, I think. Maybe six, I don't know. About five. I highly recommend it. You print this out again. If, if you don't have a copy, it's free at the website. Go to GaryCarpenter. Well, it's, uh, it's at Tim's. I think they put it at Tim's as a PDF file at DaveRoberson.com. If, you, if you, for some reason you have trouble with that one, you can get it from the face-to-face -face section at GaryCarpenter.org. I really recommend you do this. But beyond reading this, the doing of it, the doing of it, everything that we're doing today came by this method. The website, uh, all of the teachings available in MP3. Now, there was a lot of natural learning we had to do. It was not like he didn't sit there and school me. This is how you tag an MP3, son. <laughs> I had to get in there and learn how to do those things. Okay? How to make an MP3. He sent it, but when it got beyond us, he would send people to help us. You know, like I have a webmaster. My webmaster lives in Oregon. I've only met her one time in all these years. But boy, it has been a divine relationship, you know. God, God arranged that. Come to find out, as for a long time she lived in, uh, I think it's Roseburg, Rose, maybe Oregon. Come to find out, in the early days when Dave was traveling all over the Northwest, when Dave would come to their area, Dave used to stay at her grandmother's house in the guest bedroom. We didn't even know that. We were already hooked up for a long time. You know what I mean is already doing the website and everything for a while before we finally made that connection. Say, well, my Dave Roberson, my grandmother used to have. Was Dave ever in the Northwest? I go, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that something? All right, we gotta gotta stop. Wait, learn to wait upon God. If that waiting upon God has been lost to this generation, but He has given the information how to do it again. You don't need to wonder. You don't need to be guessing. You don't need to be assuming His will for your life. The Holy Spirit has been sent to relieve us from all those things. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to go ahead and start doing the confessions now. And if I can find them. So just, you just say after me, say, Father, I worship you, I glorify you, and I praise you. You're not a man that you could lie. You have exalted your word above your name. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. Therefore, I say, your glory is present at the prayer center. The blind see, the deaf hear. I keep seeing myself sliding that one stronghold down the rope. There's going to be a teaching on that. We got to have lunch or something. Because, you know, other strongholds came off. You know, but I really like that one. That was my Gibeonite. Boy, that preach is really perfect. That was my Gibeonite. I had made a league with that nicotine. These other, I mean, we dealt with other, remember I gave the pickup away? Dealt with that stronghold? Dealt with other strongholds, you know? I could, so I would deal with some of them. They'd fall to the floor. That one, we slide that one down the rope. I like that one. <laughs> That's a good one. Anyway, <laughs> that is so perfect. Okay. Let's do second paragraph again. Therefore I say, your glory is present at the prayer center. <laughs> the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. A minimum of a thousand people are born again at the prayer center every week. 
we have a minimum of 500 intercessors who are holding up the message that has come to maturity. We are able to get along with each other while the Father works revival in our midst. We have that kind of worship that takes us beyond the veil of the flesh in order that we may worship in spirit and in truth. We worship you, Father, out of our new nature. And we give you family worship as your sons and daughters. Father, at the prayer center, those that come will see a people transformed to the nature of Christ. Father, we say in the name of Jesus, no person ever leaves the prayer center the same way they came. Every person that comes receives a touch from the Good Shepherd. Father, those that come who are beaten down, discouraged, worn out, and tired, they won't leave that way. I'll make it shorter. They'll be encouraged, strong, and mature. They'll leave standing upright, their shoulders squared. Their heads held high, going forth as a mighty army to take this planet for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, Father, your glory fills every service. Let's personalize it. Every time I come, I drink of your glory. When I leave, I leave as an earthen vessel filled with your glory. I am filled with your wisdom. I am filled with your love. I am filled with your grace. And I am anointed by your spirit. I carry your presence with me. And I carry revival around this world. Father, we declare, (laughs) we preach your gospel. We'll never settle for man's gospel. Only yours. It's the gospel that saves, the gospel that fills, and the gospel that heals. That's why we say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Blind, see. Lame, walk. Deaf, hear. Maimed, Behold, dead, rise again in the name of Jesus. Father, that's your gospel. We'll we'll settle for nothing less. We're going for the gold. We have what we say. And we say at every service, the lost are saved. People are filled with the Holy Ghost. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the maimed are made whole, and even the dead are raised in the name of Jesus. More than 12 legions of angels are loosed to prepare the way for revival. Angels are dispatched to the four corners of the earth intercepting and stopping every mission and every assignment of the enemy that would bring circumstances against those who would come. Angels are changing those circumstances by rearranging them and causing money to come and by changing schedules. We say... Every person that is to be here will be here. In the name of Jesus. There is no devil big enough. No assignment crafty enough. No assignment wily enough. No circumstances bad enough. 
that will keep even one from being here. Father, we declare your house full. Angels are moving back. The forces of darkness over this region. Opening up a window. A window of light. 25 miles in every direction. Both horizontally and vertically. <laughs> there is a fortress of angels. Surrounding us to keep back the darkness. Father, angels are dispatched now. Softening the hearts where hurts have wounded. Where calluses have formed. Where walls of defenses have gone up. Angels are softening the hearts. And creating atmospheres. Where the people can hear the voice of their shepherd. Angels are preparing their hearts now. So they're already receivers when they arrive. From the first words spoken. From the first song sung. From the first prayer prayed. To the end of every service. The people are free to receive from your spirit. The assignments of all devils against the prayer center, the people of the prayer center, and the leadership of the prayer center, all those assignments are dismissed in the name of Jesus. I declare those plans null and void. Devil! We're taking Tulsa from you. In fact, we already have. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Not you. We're an authority here. Not you. Devil, get out of Tulsa. Take all your demons with you. The King of Kings has made a decree. And I am speaking in his stead. The king has declared. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. The king has decreed. Captives. You are free. Every person returns. To his original inheritance. That is the born again trail. Father you have restored our inheritance. And at the prayer center, the inheritance is not just known about. We don't just teach about it, but it's received, manifested, and seen. Father, you have restored our fellowship with you. The firstborn told us to pray. Father, your will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so on earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. There are no lost people in heaven. Therefore we say, Tulsa is saved. There are no sick people in heaven. Therefore we say, Tulsa is healed. There are no demoniacs in heaven. Therefore we say, Tulsa is delivered, and there's no poor people in heaven. Therefore we say, Tulsa is prospered, and Tulsa is blessed. We declare every captive free. Every witness, now use your hoper. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's everything to do with what we see on the inside. Jamie here can see on the inside as well as anybody in here can see on the inside. So let's do our, do our part now and give him our hope as we see these things, as we say them. Every wheelchair emptied. All of them. No exceptions. Every artificial help. Wheelchairs, crutches, canes, hearing aids, glasses, stretchers, bladder bottles. They may need them when they come. 
They won't need them when they leave. And we'll have them here as trophies to the glory of Jesus the healer. All manner of sickness and all manner of diseases are healed first time, every time, all of them, no exceptions. Jesus, you healed them all then. You healed them all now. That's what we say. That's what we have in the name of Jesus. Father, there are impartations of your spirit. We declare these are the most powerful, the most anointed, the most life-changing, the most revival-producing services in history. Fresh anointings, fresh giftings like never before since the book of Acts. Father, it's you doing the works. Therefore, all things are possible. Soul, my own soul, I command you, believe this. All things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. And every backslider will come back to God. They'll never leave God again. So now, Father, in preparation, I forgive every person their trespasses against me. Father, forgive me all of my trespasses against you. I am freshly washed in the blood of the Lamb in order that my record in heaven be perfect. Therefore, I say, because of the blood, what Jesus did for me, according to my record in heaven, I have never failed God. I lay down my life that the life of Christ may be manifest in me. I take no offense. I give no offense. And according to my record in heaven, I never have. At the prayer center, the mind of Christ is delivered to the sheep and the shepherds. It's delivered with such simplicity and with such clarity that the wayfaring fool could not misunderstand it. Therefore, I say, the people at the prayer center, and especially me, we all understand every word that Pastor Dave teaches. Every need is met, no matter how large, no matter how small, there are no cases too hard. There are no cases too late. Whatever they come for to receive from Jesus, they get it, all of them, first time, every time, no exceptions. I declare every captive free, free in spirit, free in soul, free in body. All are delivered, all are restored. Father, you are provider. Angels are dispatched to gather in all of the finances and everything that is required. Things we know about now, things we don't even know about yet, because you are the God who answers before we call. I speak against the strongholds of lack. And I declare in abundance, abundance be in the name of Jesus. Therefore, we say there is no lack. We operate from abundance. We operate from surplus. We have all in abound with many baskets left over. We have such abundance. We can pay the way for many to come. 
and many to go. We send them out on prosperous journeys for God with abundance in a manner fitting for servants of the Lord. Our financial granaries are full because our king has found stewards he can trust. And I'm one of them. Father, if you need anything, come to my house first. Whatever you have need of, come to my house first. All I need to know is my Lord has need of it. And it's yours. I've been bought with a price. My life is not my own. I am a first class servant. Lord, I lay all my possessions at your feet. I say again, Lord, if you need anything I have, it's yours. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength. The second commandment is like unto the first. I love my neighbor as myself. Now this next part, we're calling those things which be not as though they were. You're not lying, okay? I love my good neighbors. I love my bad neighbors. I love my mean neighbors. And I love my enemies. Jesus, you are my Savior. You are my Lord. Whatever you ask, that's what I do. I am your servant. I am your bond slave by my own free will choice. I serve you, Lord, by serving these people that you love so much. I serve the good people. I serve the bad people. I serve the mean people. And I especially serve your enemies because you're trying to save them all. You'd like to use me to do it. All that I have is yours. My time is yours. My body is yours. My family is yours. I own nothing. I am your bond slave. Use me as you will. You are provider for me, my family, and all that I have. And I am available for your use. We lift up the blood-stained banner over this city. Written in the blood of Jesus, on the banner are these words. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Tulsa is in revival. Tulsa is in revival. And where Jesus is Lord... The Father's will is done. So, Father, have your way. Not just 30-fold, not just 60-fold, but 100-fold. Again, I say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Captives, go free. Blind, see. Deaf, hear. Lame, walk. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Forever. Your will be done in Tulsa. Just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so in earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Now shout about it. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. We worship you. We glorify you. We have what we say in the name of Jesus. We do not doubt in our heart to believe what we say shall come to pass. We have what we say. We glorify you and praise you. Your will is done in this city. Tulsa is the city of God in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Joseph, if you haven't seen this, this is our prayer box. And uh, there's faces on here. Most of these are impossible cases according to the world. Uh, raise your hand, Marvinas. Marvina. Her daughter, Victoria, is on here. She was a, it's a birth defect, born with a, a, a brain defect. Medical science, even modern medical science, has no hope at all. They have no plan for Victoria. How many of you know, how, you think our God is bigger than birth defects? Remember the man born blind? Remember the man born lame from his mother's womb? All right. Each one of these represents that kind of a case. Just one of the, then inside of here are all kind of prayer requests. So during this portion, you don't have to repeat after me, but just join your faith with me and we'll, we'll pray about all this. So if you extend your faith in your hand if you want to. Now, Father, just like I explained to Joseph, Father, we have already prayed about every one of these situations. On these faces on the outside, Father, medical science has no hope, nothing to offer at all. But you are the God of hope. Father, all things are possible with you. We have already prayed for each and every one of these cases. Father, we believed that we received when we prayed. And that's our part of the equation. Your part is that we shall have it. Father, we're thanking you now that we will see the manifestation of that which we have already received in prayer and we'll see it in the land of the living. Father, we thank you. We know that in this prayer re box here is probably every kind of prayer from hangnails to suicide and marriage trouble and drug problems and everything that you could think of. Father, your word tells us that if we ask anything that's according to your will, we know that you hear us. And really, that's all we need to know because our confidence is if you hear us, then we have the petition that we desire of you. So, Father, we're joining our faith together with all of these, and we're thanking you now for answering every single prayer that Jesus paid the price for them to have. Father, if a stranger sent in a prayer request, someone who's not yet born again, not yet in your family, not yet in the kingdom, Father, we pray like Solomon prayed. Answer the prayer of the stranger. We don't care if he's a Muslim, a Buddhist, or a Hindu, or an atheist. Father, if you had enough faith to send a prayer request here, Father, answer that prayer. Do it in such an unusual and unique way that he'll, he or she will have to know that you're the God that answered that prayer. So they can come to the knowledge that you're the only true and living God. They can hear the gospel of your son. Believe it and be saved in Jesus' name. Father, concerning these prayer claws on the top of this box, Father, you're the same God today that you were in the book of Acts. Father, you do the same miracles today. We thank you for saturating these claws with the tangible presence and the tangible anointing of your spirit. Our faith is that that anointing and presence travels with the cloth. When these claws are laid on the sick, they will recover. If they're laid on people that have devils, those devils will come out. Alcoholics will be delivered. Drug addicts will be delivered. Wayward children will come to their senses, return to their parents' house. Lord, you'll heal marriages. You'll turn the hearts of the parents to the children and many other special miracles you do because you haven't changed at all. You're the same God today that you were in the book of Acts. Father, we do lift up Pastor Dave, especially this week while he's in Cleveland, Tennessee. Father, and I don't know who's with him, but Father, we thank you for protection of angels around them. No harm will come. You'll get them safely back to us, Lord. Father, we lift up Rosalie in the house. We lift up Tim and Leah Stemple. Lord, we're so thankful for the wisdom, uh, the teaching that's been coming forward through Tim. We lift up Tim and Leah Stemple in all of their house. Father, we lift up every minister. Father, right now I'm think, reminded that Alan is in Canada. We thank you for a safe return for Alan. Thank you for an outpouring of anointing that surprises even him. And Father, every minister, every, every minister and their families that ministers here at the prayer center, and not just here, but around the world. Father, all of the staff who labor so faithfully behind the scenes, and all of those who may not officially be on staff, but in your mind they are. Father, we declare no weapon formed against them will prosper, but everything they set their hand to do will prosper in the name of Jesus. And then last but not least, Father, Tim only got to barely introduce time management today or time utilization. Father, we need that help. 
we're faced with another week. This week is going to go by, whether we pray or not, whether we fast or not, whether we confess the word or not. Father, there's so many things to take our time, even good things. Feeding the, the hungry and clothing the naked and evangelizing the lost. Those are all good things. But Father, you have given us a specific assignment, and that's to go far enough into you to bring a supernatural revival to a religious city. Father, help us manage our time so that we spend that time we need doing the message. Help us not spend too much of our time, too much of our energy, and too much of our resources on good things that are not the God thing you called us to do. Lord, one day we're going to stand before you. We're going to give an account of the stewardship of our lives. Father, when we stand there, we want to be able to have that same testimony that Paul had. We fought the good fight. We kept the faith. And we finished the race that you set in front of us. We know endurance is the key. And thank you for helping us with endurance. Thank you for your grace. We thank you for all of these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody says... Amen.